Welcome to Friends and Fiction, four New York Times bestselling authors, endless stories. Novelists Mary Kay Andrews, Kristen Harmel, Christy Woodson Harvey, and Patty Callahan Henry are four longtime friends with more than 70 published books between them. Together, they host Friends and Fiction with author interviews and fascinating insider talk about publishing and writing to highlight and support independent bookstores. They discuss the books they've written, the books they're reading now, and the art of storytelling. If you love books and you're curious about the writing world, you're in the right place. Hello, everyone. It's Wednesday night and it's time for Friends in Fiction. Let's get rolling because we have two amazing guests to get to tonight and lots more to celebrate. I'm Christy Woodson Harvey. I'm Patty Callahan Henry. I'm Kristen Harmel. And I'm Mary Kay Andrews. And this is Friends in Fiction, four New York Times bestselling authors, endless stories to support indie bookstores, authors, and librarians. Tonight, we'll be welcoming Abby Jimenez and Rebecca Kwong. And we are so excited to get going. And of course, you know that we're not just here with our fabulous guests, but we're here to bring you incredible authors, hot reads, and fascinating interviews, all while supporting independent booksellers. One way that you can help us support indies is to buy from them when and where you can. Or you can visit our own friendsinfictionbookshop.org page, where you will find both Abby and our Rebecca, we were going to call her Rebecca, and books by the four of us and all of our guests at a discount. And speaking of amazing books, don't forget to join the Friends and Fiction official book club with Brenda and Lisa on their Facebook page. It's a separate Facebook page, and you can join them next week on May 25th at 7.30 p.m. for a happy hour with Ron Block. And we hope that you are getting ready for the June 19th live discussion with moi, about the secret book of Flora Lee. And yeah, speaking of books, our books, this is the year, all four of us have new novels being released. And in that vein, one of the ways to get our books is through our Friends in Fiction First subscription box from independent bookstore, Booktown with an E in Manasquan, New Jersey. If you order now from Booktown, you'll get signed first editions of all four books, plus the exclusive Friends in Fiction tea towel. Find out more at booktownwithane.com. Now, you've been listening to our Writer's Block podcast, haven't you? If you haven't, what are you doing? It's the one that drops every Friday on all major podcasting platforms. So we'll always post a link to the newest episode on the Friends in Fiction Facebook page and the Instagram feed. On our most recent episode, Out Now, Ron and Christy talked to Laura Hankin about her new novel, The Daydreams. Coming this Friday, May 19th, Ron will be joined by Mary Alice Monroe to talk to Kristen Ness about her novel At Loggerheads. So listen, review, subscribe, and share with a friend if you like what you hear. Now, without further ado, let's welcome Abby Jimenez. Abby is the New York Times bestselling author and Food Network champion living in Minnesota. Her debut novel, The Friend Zone, was an Audi Award finalist and was featured on NPR. In a starred review, Kirkus called her second novel, The Happy Ever After Playlist, which has a film adaptation in the works, a perfect blend of smart, heart-wrenching, and fun. Abby also founded Nadia Cakes out of her home kitchen back in 2007. The bakery has since gone on to win numerous Food Network competitions and has amassed an international following. Abby herself is a bit of a TikTok sensation with nearly a half million followers. She also runs the Abby Jimenez Reader Group on Facebook with more than 14,000 members. Abby loves a good romance, coffee, doglets, which I have to find out exactly what that is. Yeah. <laughs> and not leaving the house. Her new novel, Yours Truly, with great acclaim and much hand clapping and happiness, was just released <laughs> last month. Juan, can you bring Abby on? Hi, Abby. Welcome. Hey, Hi, thanks Abby. for having me. We're, we are glad to have you here. Okay. Now, ladies, in Abby's book, Yours Truly, Jacob, the love interest, buys Brianna the main character, Red Velvet Cupcakes from a famous local bakery, which happens to have the same name as the one founded by Abby. 
<laughs> he's offering. Now, here's my question for everybody. What food is your idea of the perfect seduction sauce? <laughs> Christy, you want to share? Oh, my gosh. So I thought about this and I, you know, I'm, I, I'm gluten free because, yes. And my favorite, very favorite sweet treat is coconut cake with some lemon curd in the middle. Mm -hmm. And for my birthday, a, a couple years ago, a friend made a gluten free and it was like 25 steps gluten-free coconut cake with lemon curd. And I have wow. never quite, quite felt so loved. <laughs> I won't tell her that you can get that from Caroline's cakes now. Oh yeah. Well, that was years ago. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love it. Um, you know, I'm, I am just chocolate and champagne and I'm not even picking <laughs> on what the chocolate is. Like I'm kind of equal opportunity. So basically like, you know, that's, those are my, my two favorite things, put them together and it's just a good day. <laughs> All is well. If you make me a big steak on the grill and serve it with a red wine, I am, I am yours. That is, that's just all I really need. <laughs> good to remember. But, but I, I, I do have to say though, there is something nice about, um, and uh, somebody making you something that, um, that isn't something they love, you know, that's just something that's all about you. Yeah. So I, I would say that too. There's sort of this, there is a seduction in the kindness of that. that is, yeah. yeah. Well, mine is, is probably fettuccine bolognese and, Really, I would prefer it if you take me back to this tiny restaurant in Tuscany where we went eight years ago <laughs> oh, and wow. served it to me there. But all right. <laughs> now, send this clip to Tom. <laughs> yeah. Abby, what's your seduction sauce? You know, my husband's been really into making French bread from scratch. He's like in his Ooh. Emily Tucci era. Oh. And I am I'm loving every second of it. You can always seduce me with bread nice does, <laughs> does he use a bread machine or does he do it all by no, hand he's like make he's like kneading it by hand and then oh you my know, god it to rise on the table for three hours and then bacon has got this beautiful crust and he serves it with like butter dripping out of it it's so good Ooh, it's so that good. sounds amazing yeah. okay. okay can i change my answer <laughs> can i <laughs> No, because we're going to dive right into your truly. <laughs> Abby, can you give us the elevator pitch for this, your fifth novel? Yes. So Brianna Ortiz is a 35-year-old ER physician, and she was the best friend in my uh, uh, book, Part of Your World. And she's two weeks away from her divorce being finalized. She's kind of living like the worst year of her entire life. Her little brother, Benny, is in end-stage renal failure and is in need of a kidney transplant. And this new guy starts at her work and they immediately butt heads. She doesn't like him. Um, they get off on the wrong foot. And um, he feels really bad about that. Jacob Maddox is sort of going through his own stuff. His little brother is marrying his ex-girlfriend. And Jacob's whole family is really worried about him. And Jacob decides to write Brianna a letter explaining why they didn't get off um, the best when they, when they met Jacob deals with some generalized anxiety disorder and social anxiety. And he writes her this really beautiful letter and she ends up writing him back and he writes her back and they start this wonderful, very chatty back and forth and become friends. And Jacob decides that he's going to donate his kidney to her little brother without telling her. And then of course she immediately finds out like within 12 hours, this is not spoilery stuff. This is all back of it jacket cover stuff. Uh, she is so indebted to him. She's like, what can I do to, to make this up to you? What can I do to repay you for this incredibly generous thing you're doing? And he's like, well, I actually need a fake girlfriend for a few months. So my family doesn't worry about me while my brother's marrying my ex. So Brianna signs on to fake date him and you have to read the rest. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. What a great hook. What a great hook. Oh, we're done. Okay. <laughs> so we know that you had a really successful career as a bakery owner, and now you're writing hugely successful novels. So it seems you've got the Midas touch on all fronts. So I want to know what led you to writing away from bakery to writing. And is there a tie between them? Is there some kind of thread that goes between the two kinds of arts that you can see? Uh, sort of. They're both creative. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I started decorating cakes, not really like the baking so much. 
it wasn't really the baking that drew me to that career. It was the cake decorating. So I started as a cake decorator and then added the cupcakes after the fact. Um, But they're both creative outlets. And, you know, the cake decorating was a hobby of mine. And then the writing was also a hobby of mine. And, you know, when you have a hobby, it's really easy to practice it because you love it. So I just get really, really good at my hobbies. And luckily, my hobbies are things that other people like to enjoy. (laughs) But I have a great time doing both things. I mean, cupcakes and romance novels, like, it's perfect. (laughs) <laughs> Lucky you that the things you love are the things you're also really good at, because that doesn't always happen. Mm-hmm. That's true. Yeah. true. That's true. Well, Jacob, the love interest in yours truly, is a hardcore introvert and, as you mentioned, has some social anxiety. You write very convincingly about his struggles with anxiety and his coping mechanisms, and I'm sure that readers like me will wonder how you achieved that level of authenticity. So can you tell us a little about that? So I'm also an introvert. Uh, my bio, I don't like leaving the house. <laughs> so I, do, I deeply understand Jacob. Um, and, you know, I, I always use mental health beta readers in my books um, just to make sure that I get it right. But incidentally, my beta readers had no notes for this book because I also very oh. deeply understand anxiety. Uh, I was a little worried that the anxiety rep in the book was going to be triggering for people that have anxiety. And it actually turned out to be the opposite. People felt very seen reading this book. A lot of people didn't know that what they were experiencing was anxiety until they read this book. And then they were able to put a name on it. And they were like, oh my gosh, that's, that's me. Um, But yeah, I deeply, I deeply understand anxiety and was very easy to write Jacob. I, I, it was so easy to be in his head. Hmm. Well, and you know, Jacob is not the usual alpha male that we find in romance or women's fiction. So was that a deliberate decision on your part? Oh, yes. Um, None of my heroes are really alpha males. They are all cinnamon rolls. I I love writing. (laughs) I love that. Yeah, they're these sweet, gooey, emotionally intelligent, kind men. Uh, And everybody said that Daniel and Part of Your World was really hard to top, but Jacob totally. He's going to be a hard act to follow. Jacob is just the best. He's so sweet. And and I also like that, um, you know, Jacob's character normalizes mental health care, normalizes taking medication, normalizes as, you know, going to a therapist and using skills to help you get through your days. Um, You know, while he does struggle with this anxiety, he very much um, works on himself and, you know, uses a lot of skills that he's learned in therapy to overcome his challenges, which I loved. I loved putting that on the page. Yeah, that's awesome. You know, I think one of the things that that draws us to this book um, and that really brings Jacob across as a cinnamon roll type of guy, right? Is the excellent banter between him and Brianna rolled out in alternating first person chapters. So can you talk a little bit about how you achieved that? Yeah. So all of my books are um, written in first person and they are all dual POVs because I love, I love being in each of their respective heads and, you know, sort of knowing the things that the other character doesn't know yet because you're in their head. Um, But yeah, banter is is a specialty of mine. Um, You know, actually way back before I was a published author and I wrote my very first very terrible YA dystopian (laughs) romance novel that I ran through this um, site called Critique Circle. Um, I, the first thing that people said about my work was that my banter, my dialogue was really, really good. So that's one thing that I lean really heavily on in my novels. I always have from the very first one. Um, I love texting and, and the letter writing and the back and forth and the phone calls. And, um, that's, that's, that's sort of my specialty. If you love banter, uh, you're, you would definitely love my books. Where do you think that comes from in your own life? How, I mean, if you've been doing that throughout the whole course of your career, Um, And that sort of has come naturally to you since the beginning. Where do you think that comes from? You know, it's always been really natural for me to, I think, I think I'm a very empathetic person. And because of that, it's very easy for me to put myself uh, in other people's heads. It's very easy for me to pick up on the cadence of their speech um, for, you know, me to understand how they would approach a situation. And I don't know, just dialogue is just, it's just easy for me. People ask me, you know, how do you, how do you write the dialogue? I just write the way I speak. You know, if you read it out loud and you wouldn't say that word in a casual conversation with somebody, then you probably shouldn't have it in your dialogue. You know, mm-hmm. sometimes I, I notice a lot of authors, um, can use, I don't know, like stiff language that they wouldn't actually use in a, in a real conversation talking with somebody. You, you want to, write the way you speak. So I write the way I speak or the way that my characters would speak. 
And you do it so well. Um, in your author's note at the end of yours truly, you talk about your own struggles with an autoimmune diagnosis that resulted in your own kidney failure in 2020. Can you talk about how, what made you decide to use that experience in the plot of this book? Cause it's, it's kind of a deeply personal thing, isn't it? Yeah. So in 2020, I got a very surprise out of nowhere diagnosis. Um, I noticed that my hair was thinning a little bit and I ended up going to the doctor for this and it was so minor. I almost like I was gaslighting myself. I was like, oh, there's nothing. It's just, it's an election year. You know, everybody's hair is falling out. Um, and I ended up um, going to the doctor and finding out that my kidneys were in distress. I was diagnosed with a lifelong progressive autoimmune disease and uh, chronic kidney disease. And I was very lucky that I caught it as early as I did because your kidneys don't like to tell you when they're sick. Uh, you'll be in stage three kidney, kidney disease before you'll have any symptoms of kidney disease. Um, I went through this really horrible six month period where my condition was not improving. Um, and luckily, out of nowhere and sort of to the amazement of my doctors, I went into a full remission. And I really wanted to write the kind of character that I, the kind of hero that I almost needed, which was somebody who would donate a kidney to somebody who needed it. Um, you know, I have this platform, I have this incredible readership, and I have this ability to educate people on things that make a difference. And this is one of those things that I feel like I needed to, to be that vulnerable and tell my story so that I could educate people. And, and it's been amazing. The amount of messages that I get, I have had, I've had messages from pediatric nephrologists, kidney doctors, um, the National Kidney Association actually wants to interview me for their website. Um, I've had people that are in renal failure who's, and I've had people that have had kidney transplants that need kidney transplants. They've all reached out to me, thanking me for raising awareness for this. I don't think a lot of people realize that you can donate a kidney and you'll have a completely normal life expectancy. You can live a normal life with one kidney and a living donation lasts so much longer than a deceased donation. Um, and also has a lower risk of rejection as well. So, you know, living donations, they save people's lives. So I'm, I'm very glad that this book has been as popular as it is. Um, and that so many people are learning about this because, you know, like I said, that was almost the kind of hero that I needed. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Well, Switching gears a little. Yours yours truly is a romantic comedy, or not switching gears, but along that line, yours truly is a romantic comedy, but it also tackles hard topics like you were discussing, you know, not only this chronic illness, but also infidelity and depression, which we've talked about a little bit, and fear of abandonment. So how do you balance the light with the dark? Uh, you know, I tend to approach life with uh, a touch of sarcasm and, and humor. You know, I, I think you can find humor even in the worst situations. You can laugh at a funeral. You can, you know, find yourself with a blown tire in the middle of a rainstorm on the side of the highway and laugh about it. You know what I mean? Even though it's not really funny. Um, and, you know, I just like to incorporate that into my books. You know, I that's sort of my brand is I, I have these very deep topics, but my books are also very funny. Um, people will tell you they laugh and they cry when they read my books. And I don't know, it's just something that's, it's always been easy for me to do. I probably, again, because that's just the way that I experience the world. Well, Abby, you've been an incredible guest and we loved ha having talked to you today about yours truly. Before we let you go, could you tell everybody where they can find you online and on tour? Are you still on tour? I've got uh, a few more stops. Um, you can find all of that at my link tree, which is in the bio of all my social media. I'm on uh, TikTok. I'm on Instagram. I'm on Facebook. I've got a really active Facebook group that I do a lot of uh, exclusive giveaways in. So it's always great to be in there. And you can also sign up for my emails on my website, which is authorabbyjimenez.com. Um, I always send out book tour information uh, via email as well, in case you're not on social. But um, yeah, it was, it's been so great being on the show. I was so excited when I got invited. I want you guys to know. I was like, oh, that's awesome. Okay. We're so excited. You said yes. Yeah. yes. We're so thrilled. We could. And, and, and Abby, you know, you have to leave the house for book tour, right? I'm like, that's a thing. <laughs> that's a thing. You got to leave. I love it. Oh, all right. Well, thank you so much for being here, Abby. We really, really appreciate it. And um, we want to remind our readers to um, 
run out right now and pick up yours truly from their local bookstore or of course it's available on our bookshop.org page and we're just we're so grateful for your time and we can't wait to um, continue following you online and see what you're up to next thank you thank good you, night Abby. bye all right well we are so excited to get to rebecca kwong but first a few quick messages from us i know i said this before but does anybody remember Mary Kay, tell me you remember when the TV would stop and say, it is time for station identification. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Nobody else remembers that. I okay. remember. You remember, <laughs> Kristen? It's so funny. It is now time for station identification. Well, pause and for station identification. Pause for, yeah. All right. With all four of us having new releases this year, we have some simply amazing events coming up. You can catch us live multiple times this year. We loved seeing so many of you in Charleston for the launch of The Secret Book of Flora Lee. It was, it was out of this world. I can't even, I'm still floating around on it. And next, we will be in Huntsville, Alabama on June 6th, close to my stomping grounds, to celebrate the launch of Kristen's The Paris Daughter. Kristen. I know you probably don't realize this, but your book is out in three weeks. Yeah, it's crazy. I can't even believe it. <laughs> how did, how three did that weeks. <laughs> um, and then we are on to Tampa, Florida on July 20th at Oxford Exchange for Christie's The Summer of Songbirds. Um, and then on to Beaufort, North Carolina on August 1st for a breast cancer fundraiser with all of us, including Meg and Ron. Tickets are finally and now available. And last, but absolutely not least, because everything starts with MKA. We will be together in Darien, Connecticut on October 4th to launch MKA's Bright Lights Big Christmas. All right. Well, make sure that you're signed up for our Friends in Fiction newsletter and for all of our individual newsletters so that you will be the first one to know more when we announce these amazing things that we want We want to see you. Um, so, all right. Now on to our next main event. Time for our guest, Rebecca Kwong. Right. Rebecca Kwong is an award-winning number one New York Times bestselling author of the Poppy War Trilogy, and babble in arcane history. A Marshall Scholar, she has a Master in Philosophy in Chinese Studies from Cambridge and a Master of Science in Contemporary Chinese Studies from Oxford. She is now pursuing a PhD in East Asian Languages and Literatures at Yale, where she studies diaspora, contemporary Chinese literature, and Asian American literature. For her work as a fantasy author, Rebecca has won the Astounding Award. I won an Astounding <laughs> Award, right? <laughs> so, Patty, Patty, you've won the Christie Award. Let's be honest. Like Christie, astounding. astounding. And I think um, when I read, she has this incredible novel you just mentioned, Mary Kay um, Babel, and it, it should win every award. But she's also been nominated for the Hugo, the Nebula, the Locus, and World Fantasy Awards. And her newest novel, Yellow Face was just released yesterday by William Morrow, and we are so excited to talk about it. So let's bring her on. Hi, Hi Rebecca. Hi, Rebecca. Welcome. Well, Rebecca, there is a lot to unpack in this twisty new novel of yours. So give us a little taste of what it's all about. Sure. Well, I should preface this with letting you all know that this was my pandemic novel. And I think ah. you can always tell when books come out in 2022, early 23. Yes. Those were written in 2020. So, you know, there's a particular kind of gremlin energy going on. <laughs> That's I true. Time. I was frustrated. I was sad and isolated. And I think we all went a little bit unhinged. Um, so it's my gremlin novel, and it's a big, ridiculous satire of the publishing industry. It's about two writers. Um, one is white, one is Chinese-American. The Chinese-American one dies in the first chapter, so it's not a spoiler. But to set the tone of how ridiculous things get, she dies in a pancake-eating contest. And the white <laughs> writer, our protagonist, 
steals her unpublished manuscript, which is a big war epic about Chinese laborers on the front during World War I, and then she submits and publishes it as her own, all while pretending to be vaguely Chinese American when she's not. So it's this big, romping, ridiculous look into the shadier sides of the industry, the lies we tell about ourselves. Um, but at the heart of it, it's really about a toxic friendship and oh. how difficult um, hatred and jealousy can get between writers. Oh, wow. Oh, that's awesome. I, and I think those are themes that are so relevant, you know, be, and not just in the world of writing, but in so many different realms, right? I, I mean, I think uh, jealousy and things like that can be toxic wherever they are. But mm -hmm. yes, I think this hit us all, you know, right in the gut as writers <laughs> ourselves. <laughs> From the first page. So, the first yeah. page. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> So, you know, you, Rebecca, made a huge splash in the world of fantasy with your earlier novels, but this is a really different kind of book from, from that. So can you talk a little bit about what prompted that switch? Or maybe it's not quite as big of a switch as it appears to be. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, well, I'm I'm so tickled that people keep reporting this as my literary debut, and it's my fifth <laughs> book, and I just would think that you're not a debut anymore after four books. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I've never thought there was such a big difference between fantasy and literary fiction. In fact, I think genre labels are kind of silly and function often to denigrate certain genres, right? We like to categorize books as romance because they're just for women and we don't take them seriously. We like to categorize books as fantasy because that's not proper literature. We don't take it seriously. So I, I don't really, you know, I dispense with all that. I think storytelling is storytelling. But Yellowface is told in a very different voice than, say, Babel. Babel is this ponderous Dickensian Bildungsroman and Yellowface is this zippy, you know, sit down, read it in one sitting kind of contemporary thriller. And I, the reason why I did that is because I get I get bored really easily. <laughs> and I made the mistake of signing on for a trilogy with my first book ever. And, and I was very young at the time and I didn't know that that meant the next five years of my life would be stuck with the same characters, the same plot, the same world, the same tone. And it's just, I mean, Five years is, is a long time period, but between the ages of 19 and 24, when you're changing so much as a person and graduating college, becoming an adult, figuring out who you are, it's it's really hard to be stuck with the same project for that, that entire time. So by the time I'd finished the popular trilogy, I thought I'm never doing the same thing twice ever again. So I went from Dickens to a voice that sounds more like a, a Twitter meltdown, the shy, <laughs> like, the zippy voice, the very fast paced action. I've, I've had so much fun in that world was there was there concern that you were not i guess when you had the idea for this and you took this on was there concern that you'd struggle with finding that new voice or did you feel um just as confident about that as you had been with the previous books well, I do this thing when I enter a new genre that I call vocal training. And I basically read as widely around the genre as I can. I read all the major works. I try to absorb the common tropes, the language, the rhythm of the sentences, the colloquialisms. And I started this deliberately with Babel because it's set in the 1830s. And it's really easy to get the Victorians wrong. You know, one little mistake yeah. in slang or, or description and you've given yourself away as an American 2023. So I thought, well, there's the only way I can imitate the voice of Victorians is just to read the Victorians. And then I fell in love with Dickens and, and started consciously modeling my sentences after his, these, these run on sentences where he doesn't trust punctuation. And that's gotten me in hot water with my advisors. I had one paper returned with the comment, do you hate periods? What's with all these <laughs> Um, so, so after spending all that time in Dickens's world, I thought, well, it's time to shift gears and try something new. So I've actually been reading a lot of contemporary thrillers, and I'm working on a piece about this um, for Harper's Bazaar that will come out in a little bit. But I'm thinking about the voice of the contemporary female-led psychological thriller. Um, and so I'm thinking of books like Gone Girl or The Woman in the Window, etc. cetera, um, that new movie that Mila Kunis is in and on Netflix. And I noticed there's this recurring voice that's that's really bitchy. It's <laughs> nasty, it's mean. It, listening to that voice 
feels like sitting with your meanest friend at the bar as she insults every single person who walks in. And I'm wondering why is that voice so compelling and addictive? These are not good people. We would never want to be that person or really spend all that much time with that kind of person. But but we love listening to them, and I'm wondering why. So so that's how I trained myself to write a book like Yellow Face. I love that. Oh, I love that. So deliberate. Like you said, this is what I want to do. Okay, so I absolutely, I mentioned it off screen, loved Babel. But is it Babel or Babel? Well, you can say both. I noticed that um, people in the U.S. like to say Babel and people in the U.K. like to say Babel. Because I was so into this novel and I had to travel, so I bought it on audiobook. And in the audiobook, they say Babel. So I was like, oh. So I loved it. It's, it. I'm fascinated with language and language's origins, and I've written about Oxford. It just was glorious. But with Yellowface, as we've talked about, you have gone in an entirely different direction. You've captured and skewered the American book publishing industry's failings, institutional racism, cultural appropriation, and much more down to a very granular level. Did you ever worry that you'd burn down your own writing career while burning down your protagonist's writing career? <laughs> Look, it's not the kind of book you can write as a debut. I would have been terrified to publish yes. this as a debut because it drags everyone. And it often drags institutions by name. But I think that, well, so two things. The first is that I think there are more people in publishing interested in changing it for the better than yeah. people who would be so offended by this book that Agreed. they would never work with me again. And and I know, you know, at the at the level of production, the editors I work with, the publicists, the marketing folks, yeah. like these are people who are there because they love stories and they love their authors and they are interested in making publishing more diverse and accessible and better for everyone. And, and you know, it's a lot of those same people who are striking with the HarperCollins union. So yeah. I, I love, and so the second thing is, I love my team at Harper and, you know, yeah. this book criticizes a lot of what I've been through at Harper, but it's it's with the same people I've been with all along because that relationship has developed and matured and there's just this deep trust there, right? I know that I can say very frank and honest things about my experience and about racism in publishing and that my editor will back me 100%. In fact, they were egging me on. Um, I was, the, the first draft that I turned in, the, the way I write about mistreatment within the company, it's not even close to how bad things get in the final draft. And that's because there are editorial assistants and editors giving additional reads and feedback saying, well, oh, you wow. Should, oh, you don't know about this. You should, you should put this in. So it was a group effort. And I think everybody, wow. I think my team was ready for this kind of criticism and this examination of this industry. So I was never afraid during the process. I love That's that cool. they chimed in. Instead of you saying, this is how I see it, you collaborated with them in a way that, that made the story even more real and richer. I love that. That's amazing. Yeah, that's incredible. And um, although I guess really not surprising, but very, very interesting. Well, one of the recurring themes of this book is the inherent loneliness and isolation of a writer's life. Um, can you talk about June and her source and the source of her loneliness? So I think a lot about isolation and writing and community and friendship. And I think ours is a tough industry, like any kind of competitive entertainment industry where you're constantly in fear of being replaced. It's kind of an attention economy. So you always have to go on the, the promotion circuit for the next book. And, and I think especially early on in your career, it feels like if you're not hitting certain milestones and your friends are, then, then they're just over overlapping you or, or passing you and and you're never going to catch up so everybody else's success gets internalized as a threat which is not the way to survive in publishing the way to survive in publishing is to build those deep supportive friendships and and be able to root for others when they succeed but it's i think it's really hard not to let these feelings of fear and jealousy and competition get in the way of everything especially at the beginning and i think it's particularly bad now than it ever was before because of social media because social media has done wonderful things, right? It's brought readers together. It's brought writers together. It has formed communities and networks of support that we've never had before. 
for, but it also makes the writing journey very visible and creates all sorts of metrics that you can compare yourself to others with. How many Goodreads ratings do they have? What was the size oh. of their advance? You know, Publishers Marketplace has those deal announcements and they structure them to fit the dimensions of a Twitter screenshot now because the whole idea is everybody announces their deals that way. So I think and, and then you have these Instagram posts of people posting beautiful photos of their office and, and saying how many words they wrote that day. And, you know, if I've written zero words, that just sends me that sends me spiraling so quickly. <laughs> so I think it's really hard not to see everybody thriving and bragging constantly and worrying that you're falling behind. And that's a phase that June has never really gotten out of. She's incredibly lonely and isolated, in part because she's just a bad person and she's not good at making friends and she alienates the friends she has. But I did deliberately write her to be sympathetic because I think loneliness is pervasive among writers and it's constantly this battle of overcoming the inherent sense of competition to, to reach out to one another and remind each other that, no, we're here here for each other. We're not tearing each other to threads. Threads. Well, you played right into my the question I wanted to ask you about June, Juniper, Junie. She's really a polarizing character. I mean, she's an unreliable narrator. She's a grudgingly self-admitted plagiarizer and a thief <laughs> and even a bit of a blackmailer. And, you know, some of that also can be said of Athena, the woman whose work she steals. But here's what I'm wondering. Okay, you we were all isolated during the pandemic. Um, how was it living with a June Hayward in your head? Did she just keep giving you more material for her awfulness? <laughs> her awfulness. Well, it was actually quite cathartic to write in June's ah. voice because I think I've been living with June in my head for a long time. Obviously, I'm Chinese American. I'm in an industry that overwhelmingly disfavors authors who aren't white. And I think I've been told by other people so often that I've internalized it, that I don't deserve my place here, that nobody mm -hmm. really cares about my stories. The only reason why I have a spot on the list is because I'm diverse. I'm this diversity checkbox that publishers are taking that's off. Ridiculous. You know, the only thing that's interesting about me is my race, et cetera, et cetera, right? And I know none of these things are true. And I know I'm a good storyteller, but it's hard to hear year after year and not let it stick with you. So in turning June into the protagonist and writing in her voice for like 300 pages, that was an act of of trapping her onto the page in black and white and to lay out her logic in very clear, clearly articulated threads so I could put it all out there and remind myself this is ridiculous. June doesn't know what she's talking about. Her views are completely skewed. And, and now I've trapped you. And you're this, you know, venomous little um, spiteful <laughs> creature within the pages of a book that I now get to inflict on everybody else. But, but yeah. <laughs> I love that. I love you that. Know, there's, a, there's a twist at the end of the book. And, you know, we're not going to do spoilers here. But I'm wondering if that twist if you'd planned that from the beginning when you started working on this book. I am struggling with how to answer this question. Because <laughs> we don't want to spoil it. <laughs> I will say I often think of the ending of the book before I think of the middle. And that's because oh, I need to know where everything is headed. Mm -hmm. I need to know where the story engine is going so I can chug along and get to that finish line. Um, in part because I can't write chronologically. Again, I get bored really easily. So if I write <laughs> an outline for a story and think about things from bird's eye perspective, none of it is interesting to me. I need to be in the scene, in the moment, smelling what the characters are smelling, feeling how they're feeling. So I only write scenes if I'm I'm really excited about that scene at that time. But yeah. I'm in a different mood every time I sit down to the writing desk. So I don't know what what part of the book I'm capable of working on. But if I know the how the story ends, then I have that through line guiding me. So if I'm coming up with random scenes in the middle, at least I know the the larger picture that they eventually have to fit into. So the ending was planned from the very start. Oh, that makes me that. really excited because that's how I write too. Like I sit down and whatever I'm like excited about that day that like woke me up in the middle of the night or like I woke up thinking about, that's the part I write. And then I like stick it all together. <laughs> yeah. And I get so much criticism for this. People call us disorganized and messy, but I think it's just, it's part of the process. You have to trust the right. process. Here we I are. Keep, and I keep thinking about what you're saying about the venomous and the, and it, 
I, it makes me go back. It's part of the reason we started Friends in Fiction. Writers yeah. have to support each other, right? This isn't a competition yeah. sport. Um, you know, taking a writer down doesn't make our writing better. Only we yeah. make our writing better. And I love that you looked at it head on and flipped it and looked at it head on from the person who's who's bitter about it instead of the the angel about it. So well done. I think it's easy to preach, right? You know, yes. sort of be kind. And it's it's okay to acknowledge that we all have ugly feelings. I and mean, we're jealous. It's real. Yeah. It's okay to acknowledge jealousy as long as you yeah. aren't turning that into harm towards others. And yeah. in time, I found that I've been able to harness that jealousy into motivation for myself. It's something that like pushes that. me to work harder instead of lashing out at others. Oh, I, I definitely, that. yeah, that's a, the tip I learned a long time ago to read an author, a paragraph of an author whose work you really admire, just to piss you off and make you think, <laughs> I can do that, you know, maybe, <laughs> or try it. I'm going to aim for it at least, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. shoot yeah. my arrow that way instead of Definitely. being jealous. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's All what right. I do every time I have writer's block. I read a book that I really love to remind me what what words on a page can do and then suddenly i want to write again okay it's tell beautiful. us one one novel you pick up that does that for you Susanna clark's piranesi oh okay wow it's beautiful all right well rebecca you've given us so much to think about and talk about tonight before we let you go can you tell friends tell folks and friends and fiction <laughs> where they can find you in person and online I am increasingly less on Twitter now um, because I'm not sure Twitter will exist next week. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm on Instagram and TikTok, and you can also find me at my Substack. Okay. Fantastic. All right. Well, thank you so, so much for joining us tonight, Rebecca. This has been so great. And I just did want to let everyone know, um, you might have noticed that um, we we had the, um, Megan Miranda was supposed to join us tonight and due to a last minute scheduling conflict, was not able to. So we are going to have her on um, sometime this season, we promise. So, um, but anyway, we've had two amazing guests tonight that I know have wowed you just like they have us. And we just want to remind you that you can um, pick up your copy of Yellow Face wherever books are sold or on our bookshop.org page and help support Rebecca um, on her pub week. You all know how important that is. So just a reminder, you can find all of our back episodes on YouTube and we'll be back next week with Kate Morton and Lee Smith and Susan Meisner will join us for the after show. We've had such a fun episode um, tonight. We have such a fun episode in store next week and we'll see you then. Good night. Bye. Good night, everyone. Thanks, Bye. Rebecca. Thank you for tuning in. You can join us every week on Facebook or YouTube, where our live show airs on Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. Eastern time. Also, subscribe to our podcast and follow us on Instagram. We're so glad you're here.